if you have a copy of the Bible, you're very fortunate. You're very fortunate. You're blessed. We're supposed to be in a nation where we can gather together as believers in Christ and freely worship, teach the Bible, and teach salvation by grace through Christ and Christ alone. There are people all over the world today that would, would love to have this privilege where they felt safe and they could come and have a public worship like this. So I don't take it for granted. This is a special time that we have together. So turn your Bible to Luke chapter 16. This is kind of the parable chapter, except for the, uh, I don't know what that is. Does that mean, no? Yeah. It's the parable chapter, and uh, this particular story that we're going to look at today is not a parable, but you find it in a parable chapter. And that's beginning in verse number 19. Our focus today is becoming motivated to share our faith with other people. And the word motivated simply means to be encouraged or to be compelled or to feel the need in your heart uh, to to share Christ with others. I think it was Spurgeon that said, I don't know what that is. Yeah. It's, the it's, the, it's the microphone. How's that? I'll have an extra one I'll bring next week for you. Uh, I think that's better. Motivating to, motivated to share our faith with other people. Uh, I think the Spurgeon that said you just simply can't take the gospel to the wrong address. The only hope for a dying world is the gospel of Jesus Christ. And the story that we have here is very, very unusual. You will not find another story like this anywhere in any type of literature. It's unique within itself because it talks about the afterlife. And you really can't go anywhere and find information like what you're going to learn today about what the afterlife is like. And I think it's important that we know exactly what Jesus said about the destination of the souls of men. Because a church is needed in its community to be a lighthouse, that it may shine the light of the gospel of Christ into the dark areas. In the dark areas in the hearts of those who are without Christ, and they need the light, the light of the world, who is Jesus. We're in a city, we're in a surrounding called Parker, Texas. And there's about seven to 8,000 people that are in this town, or maybe more now. And out of those seven and 8,000 people, how many of those individuals are actually saved and on their way to heaven? Isn't that unusual? We don't have this around here, do we? <laughs> but I like it. <laughs> We were up at visiting a couple of churches several years ago, and they had no nursery. They brought all of the kids and babies, and there were probably seven or eight hundred of them there. And the pastor said, we love the crying sound of babies. That's our future. <laughs> it really did. So, anyway, that's okay. He probably won't. So the story that you're going to hear today is the only one like it in the Bible. To where you see... There's a certain rich man in verse 19, and Jesus is speaking and teaching this lesson. And we see that his clothing was purple, so we know that purple is a sign of royalty. So he was a wealthy person, and he could dress well. And the King James says the word fair sumptuously. It just simply means that he walked through town holding his head back, and he was proud of who he was. Uh, he had accomplished, apparently, a lot of things in life, worked hard, made a lot of money, and was enjoying that every day. And then you have a contrast in verse 20. And the contrast is you go from one extreme to another. First of all, you have the rich man who has everything. Then the next thing you have is a beggar. But what's unique about this story is you'll find in the parables there's no names mentioned. But in this particular story, there's a name mentioned. It doesn't mention the rich man's name, but he does mention the poor man's name. His name is Lazarus. Now, this is not the same Lazarus that Jesus had called 
fall down the grave. This is another man, apparently, but Nathan Lazarus was popular during those days. And so we see that he was a beggar. And you can only imagine how he must have dressed, similar to those that you and I run into probably underneath the bridge that are trying to collect money for whatever they're going to use it for. And maybe you've been to a rescue mission and you've seen some people that uh, they just don't have much. And the clothes on their back, maybe all they have, and, and they're dirty. And sometimes they're ripped and they're smelly. And uh, a beggar in this day uh, was basically trying to stay alive. There was no social system in Jerusalem to take care of people. It was if you were handicapped, if you were mentally deranged, or something was wrong with you, you simply had to go to the streets and beg. In Bogota, Colombia, I was there probably 20 something years ago, and uh, we went downtown Bogota, and on the side of Bogota, Columbia, you can see a big hill. And there's no grass up there. It's just house after house after house after house as far as you can see. And at night you can see a little candlelight flickering. But it's something to see because down below is the city. And the city is as modern as Dallas. And people have money and they have jobs. But on the streets of Bogota, all those people that are on the hillside by the thousands come down, and many of them resort to begging. And I saw some of those people that are like that. But we see something about this man who is named Lazarus in verse 21. He's hungry. He was desired to be fed with crumbs. So he's a meager man. He knows that uh, he's probably going to get a teeth on steak, but he would take anything uh, to keep from starving to death. I've never been there uh, that I can remember, but I've been told that one of the hardest things to do is to be hungry and can't find food and, and substance and your belly starts growling and gnawing at it, and you just feel horrible all over. But there's something else about this man. Uh, he desired to be fed from the rich man's table, just crumbs, but he was also very sick. We'll see that uh, he was so sick that he laid around at the gate of the rich man and the dogs in the community would come up and begin to lick uh, the sores of Lazarus. Maybe he was too weak to fight it off, fight the dog off, or maybe there was some type of healing purpose. I don't know what it was, but I can tell you this. This man is in bad shape. So look at the contrast. You have one man who's going through life. He has everything that he's ever needed. Everything that he ever wants. He's very selfishly every day. Life is clicking right along. And then at the gate of this man's house, you have a poor, meager beggar by the name of Lazarus. He's sick, full of sores, and he's hungry. And he's saying, can you please spare some crumbs from your table for me? Now, this is a picture that I want you just to hold on to for just a moment. Because I want you to look at verse 22. Those same two men, the same, remember the contrast. One has everything, and one has nothing. But look what falls upon both of them. It came to pass that who died? Well, the beggar, we would certainly probably project that he's certainly going to go first. He's not healthy. He's, he's, he's ill. He's hungry, starving. Uh, he's in bad shape physically. Uh, and then look what it says. It was carried away by the angels into Abraham's bosom. Now, this is before the ascension of Christ. This is Jesus telling the story. Before the ascension of Christ, the abode of the dead were two places. One was called Abraham's bosom slash paradise. And the other would be called Hades slash hell. So you have paradise, and then you have Hades slash hell. What you're going to see in this story is the only story that I know of on planet Earth that talks about two people that are in both of those places. One of them's in one place, and the other's in the other place. Look what happens here. Who else dies in that same verse? Rich man dies. You ever heard the old saying, you ever saw a verse pulling? Have you all ever? It all boils down to a grave. Now, the rich man was buried. So he was taken to a tomb, just like Jesus was probably buried in. It was formal. There were people hired to mourn over him. I'm sure it was a beautiful possession. Priors everywhere being paid to, to weep and cry whether they cared or not. The stones rolled over the grave, and there the body of the rich man lying. But that's not what happened to Lazarus. 
Lazarus' body was collected, taken down to the end of the street, and thrown into a garbage dump. And that garbage dump is named Gehenna. And guess what that stands for? That would be hell. Because the fire would burn continuously, burning the trash and burning the human remains. So you have two bodies, one that goes into a garbage dump, and one that goes into a tomb. So what happened to the person? Where is Lazarus and where is the rich man? I'm glad you asked because Jesus is going to tell us. In verse 23, and in hell, he lifted up his eyes to the rich man. I want you to notice not only the contrast, but I want you also to notice the consciousness of the afterlife. It's not soul sleep. This is before the ascension of Christ, and here you have a man that is able to see in a place called hell. He's looking around. He can visibly see. What's someone else? And he lifted up his eyes and being in torment. So that simply means that he has some type of a body that can feel pain. But this is kind of difficult, isn't it? There's no easy way to put this story. I, I bet when Jesus delivered this message, you know, he was probably thinking, this is the truth, no easy way to put it, tell it like it is. Not to scare people, but that you might realize that there's an eternity for all of us. There's a heaven to gain and a hell to shun. And there's only one way to heaven, and that's through accepting Christ as our personal Savior. So notice, he's in torment. And he lifts up his eyes, and who does he see in Abraham's bosom? He sees the, the poor man, Lazarus. But notice the contrast this time. The contrast has changed. Now you have a man who had everything on earth, suffering the loss of everything and even his precious soul that no amount of money could buy. He has terribly and morbidly made a huge mistake. He has gone through life and ignored the very most important thing, and that is to make sure that he's ready to meet his maker. That just didn't matter to him. Life was lived and enjoyed. But there's coming a time for all human beings to either perish by death or the rapture to be caught up. Death is real. It's something that we all face. And there's an eternity that's out there. And Jesus is saying in this message that this man is in torment. Now look verse 24. And this is the rich man, and he's crying. So he's feeling pain. And the word cry right there, he's praying. Now I wonder all the days of his life if he spent any time praying. I wonder if he ever thanked God for his food. Thank God for the wealth that he had. Looked to God and realized that it all came from the hand of God. God blessed him. He didn't even know it. And yet now he's crying. He's praying. And this is what's prayer is. Father Abraham. He says, have mercy on me. So the first cry is an appeal to get out of this place. And he's crying for mercy. There's no mercy here. It doesn't exist in the place where the rich man is. It's over. It's done. He's lived his life. He's died. And he's made a huge mistake. And he's looking for mercy. If your mercy is, don't give me what I deserve, please. He realizes this is something that he deserved now. He said, have mercy on me. And then, here's the next request. Can you get on Lazarus up there? Can, can, can you just get his attention for just a moment? I understand that he's really enjoying his place in paradise because the Bible says he's comforted, his needs are met. He's not sick anymore. Can I have an amen to that? But he's alive. He has some type of spiritual body just like this man in hell has. He can feel it, he can see it. He cannot see the man in hell. But the man in hell can see the man in heaven. What kind of pain do you think that might have been? He said, if you were to send him, that he could just 
dipped a little bit of water on my tongue. The old preachers back in the yesteryear preached a lot of them. Not to scare people, but to remind them that there is a hell to gain and a hell to shun. And people who are without Christ do not spend eternity in heaven. They spend their abode in the place called hell waiting for the resurrection, which they will raise one day and be called before the white throne judgment of God and then be judged and cast into the lake of fire for all eternity. That's how it goes. Aren't you thankful for your salvation? We found mercy in Jesus, didn't we? And I never have to face this, but there are people that I know, people that you know, that may have to face this very thing. So let's move on here. He says, I'm in torment, and now here's the word flame. So I started to say just a moment ago, you can pick up Presbyterian, Methodist, Episcopalian, you can go down the line, Baptist, uh, General Baptist, and all the old writers, they wrote about the flames of hell being real. Jonathan Edward preached a great message, sinners in the hands of an angry God. And you can still find that on, on, uh, on YouTube. And whenever he preached, they said that people who listened to him would hang on to the pew so hard their knuckles would turn white, and they were afraid that they were going to fall into the pits of hell before they could get saved. Now I don't understand that. I'm just repeating what I read and what's been said. But Abraham answers, and he says, Son, remember the lifetime you received the good things. But Lazarus received the evil things. Now think about that for just a moment. Do you remember Job come to the conclusion, who am I, not to receive that which is good at the hand of God, and then also not to receive that which is evil? Job said that. The Lord gives, and the Lord takes. So Job came to the conclusion that there are things that happen to us that are evil, that are permissible, but that is the result of the fall of mankind. We are living in a sinful, imperfect world. Some people don't think that the devil's real. They're not looking outside very well. They're not looking around this world very well because he has exposed himself completely. He is real. And he said, you remember in your lifetime you had all these good things. But at, for Lazarus, he had nothing, but, but now he's comforted and you're tormented. Now look at verse 26. He's going to tell you something about this place called heaven or paradise and this place called hell. He said, besides this, between you and there is a great gulf fixed. A vast span of space that's immeasurable is what he's saying here. Lazarus can't get to you, and you can't get to him. How many of you remember the old preacher, E.V. Hill? Oh my goodness, what a great preacher of yesteryear. He preached a famous sermon you can go look at on, online. It says there's no screen door, no submarines. Now you think about that for just a moment. And the analogy was this, there's no back doors to heaven. Once a person is there, the door is shut, and it's secured, and there's no escape from this place. He said, this is great God. You can't go there, and you can't come here. Then here's the last request. Then he said, I pray that, therefore, Father, that you would send him, where? To my father's house. So why would, okay, couldn't get Lazarus to come to the place of torment. It's impossible. Can't happen. Abraham, Abraham says, it's not going to happen. Impossible. You can't come here. He can't come there. He said, okay, I have one more request. Can you at least send Lazarus back from the dead to physically inhabit his body and go to my family? Why would we have that concern? For warning. Hmm? For warning. For warning. Okay, that's good. Matter of fact, he says, I don't want here. The first mission that we have is our family. 
That's the first mission. When the Lord saved me, I think that came to your house pretty much not too long after that, didn't I? I want to make sure my sister and my family and her children and her husband knew the Lord. Because I know the Bible. And I believe that it's true. And I don't think this is a fairy tale. I think this is a true story. And today, in this place called hell, that man is still there. And we prayed for my other sister who is in heaven now. Well, she had anything to do with all this. Did she? <laughs> she was tough, wasn't she? She was like my mom. And we get praying for her. And she ended up with very severe four stage cancer all over her body. And my sister started taking her to church. And Becky called me one day and said, Can you come over to the house? And they were living in Scott and Wiley, and that was my sister. <laughs> one of my years special. <laughs> and uh, so I went over there, and at this time she's probably, what, 80 pounds, maybe? Get close. And we never had any kind of conversations I mean, about the afterlife. I just wanted to ask her a few times, you know, you're saved, you know, you know I'm working on it. Well, she came outside, and we sit around this little table on the front porch, and I could tell that there was really something on her heart. And she leaned over to me and she said, What's it like? What? What? You know. <laughs> I don't know for sure. Yeah. I'm talking to somebody that's about to leave this earth. Matter of fact, in just a few weeks. I don't know what it's like. Telling you, our family is our first mission. Acts 16 31, believe upon the, the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved and finish it. Your house. But that house doesn't get saved unless we take the opportunity to tell them about Jesus. I remember telling you I'd say. I sit down and witness to my mom and my dad, and they said, You're crazy. <laughs> it won't last. Crazy parts were happening but it still has to <laughs> First mission is our family, all our children. When they were born in the home, we made sure that we raised them in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. They'd have an opportunity to hear the gospel. They'd have an opportunity to respond to the need of salvation. You see, what ought to compel us and motivate us to witness is this, the brevity of life. James puts it this way, black is like a vapor. It's here for just a moment, and then it vanishes away. It's hard to believe your little brother, if he lives in January, he's 65, isn't it? And she used to change the diapers over here when I was just into this world. That's how fast life is. And it's going to be over. For some of us, we get a little bit, a little bit longer than others. But ultimately, death is inevitable. That's why the greatest thing that we can do on planet Earth is be prepared for eternity. And don't you think about this. When your heart stops beating one day, and it will. It'll have its last beat. Where are you going to spend eternity? I mean, that, that is something that we have to ask ourselves, that question. Where, was, where is my son? Where's my daughter? Where's my grandchildren? Where's my uncle? Where's my aunt? Where's my co-worker? Where are these people going to spend eternity? That should matter, shouldn't it? Let's finish the story and be done. He said, I have five brothers. I will need to testify. Being motivated to share our faith simply is being motivated to give a testimony about what Jesus has done in our life. Do you remember the story of the naked man of Gadaria? That's the only way to put it, because that's what he was. 
Jesus came down the road and this man was living in the tombs. He was cutting himself. He had no clothes. He was crazy and possessed with devils. And the man saw Jesus afar off and he came running to Jesus and he said, Jesus, what do I have to do? You don't torment us. And it was basically the demons talking to Jesus. And you know the demons called Jesus, thou son of the most high God. The Bible tells us that the demons in hell know who Jesus is and they tremble. He's God. He's creator. This man meets Jesus and Jesus changes his life. And the first thing that Jesus does, he changes his destiny. No longer is he bound for hell. He's now bound for the cross. So he's going to heaven. And he wanted to go with Jesus and the disciples. And Jesus says, no, I don't need you to do that. I need you to stay right here in the good area. And go through the streets and the highways and the byways and tell people what God has done in your life. That's the testimony. So what this man was saying, have Lazarus go back and tell them about heaven and also tell them where I'm at and I want them to come here under no circumstances and let them know the best choice is to follow God in their life. That's what he wanted them to do. Abraham said in him two things. They have Moses and the prophets. Why did he say that? Moses is the law, and what's the purpose of the law? Tell us what's wrong. And what's the purpose of the prophets? To reveal Jesus. Who's the answer to that which is wrong in our life? That's who they have. He said, no, 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 no. There's something much better than that. He said, if one of them went back from the dead, look at your Bible. What would you think? If somebody that you knew had died, you know I mean? You went to the funeral and everything, you said, they gone. Five days later, they showed back up. And it was them. Pretty compelling, wasn't it? Pretty compelling. But notice what he says here. He said, They hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded the one in one. Who's the one that rose from the dead? Jesus. Walked around the earth after his death, burial, and resurrection, seen by numerous people. 500 at one time. No doubt that's him. There's no doubt he was dead. And now he's alive. And you would think that that would be enough to turn people to Jesus. I don't know what might motivate us more in a story like this. But we've got to ask ourselves the question. Is it our responsibility to share Christ with those that we know personally? Yes, it is. The second thing we must ask is, is there a plan B for people to get saved? Is there a plan B? There's not. There's a plan A on that. Third thing, who does God use to bring other people to His Son Jesus? He doesn't use the angels, does He? He uses us. So think about, begin praying for those in your reach, people that you know, people that you have influence in their life as a person, that you know that they need to hear about Jesus. And then ask God to give you an opportunity to ask them this question. You ready for it? Do you ever think about spiritual things? Do you? How much longer do you think you might live? Sweet lady here. 20 years, maybe? That'd be great, though, 30. I hope it's 50 or 60. 
but only if it came to you on permission. Then what? See there? How many people do we know that will be able to respond? They said, well, I don't, I don't even thought about it anymore. And share what Christ has done in your heart. Now that you were on the road, just like the Apostle Paul was who was Saul of Tarsus, when you came face to face with the one who knew everything about you, especially then that you needed to be saved, and you gave your heart to him. And God has changed your life. Amen? Amen, amen. Maybe bow our head for just a moment. Our heads bowed and all the God's people are praying. If there's someone here today that say, you know, I'm just not for sure that I'm going to spend eternity, but I would ask that you pray for me. Would you please remember me in prayer? Just lift your hand up right back now. I don't know where I'm going to spend eternity. I'm not for sure. But I want to be. I'm not going to come to you. I'm just going to mention your face and who you are in my heart to the Lord and pray for you. It would like that. It would like that. I would need to ask you to raise your hand on this one because we all know somebody that's without Jesus. So may we leave this place a little bit more motivated, remembering this story that's real, that Jesus told us about the suffering of one who left this earth without Christ and the joy of the other who put God first in his life. Father, thank you for this day that you've given us. Thank you for the blessings that we have that you bestowed upon us. God, I pray that you would help us be more diligent about reaching out to those who are lost in this dying world and sharing the gospel of Christ with them. And we thank you for this in Jesus' name. By the way of invitation today, uh, let's give you a chance to come. I think he's going to sing a little bit of just a closer walk with me. If you would like to have someone pray with you, maybe you're going through something today, you need prayer. You're welcome to come and join us right up here myself. It is hot here. We ask them to fix that and work on that. So if you come as a Lord leads you, if anybody needs special prayer this morning, just come out and come, grab me by the hand.